Occupational English Test Listening Test This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract. And you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a sleep specialist talking to a new patient called Georgia Douglas. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good afternoon, Mrs. Douglas. Your GP has sent you along to see me today because of some problems you're having sleeping, is that right? That's right. He says I've got RLS, you know, um, restless leg syndrome. I see. Well, I've got some notes here from your GP, but can you tell me in your own words how long ago this started and what's happened since then? Um, it all began about 18 months ago. I got this strange sensation in my legs. It was like a burning feeling, not on the skin, but inside the legs, in the muscles, and it was really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, then after a few weeks, it was as if there were insects moving about inside my legs. Oh, it was horrible. Yeah. I was fine during the day, but it started up every night as soon as I went to bed. And then it was hard to get to sleep, what with this funny feeling in my legs. Did anything help to relieve the feelings you had? What made it better, at least for a few minutes until it started again, was moving my legs. Mm -hmm. But it got to the point where I just had to move my legs. It was uncontrollable. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. Eventually I'd get to sleep, but not until two or three in the morning. And my husband said that even then I was moving my legs at very regular intervals. And that kept him awake, of course. He'd lie there waiting for the next time I moved. It got us both down, and I was more and more tired. And colleagues noticed that I was sleepy at my desk. I'm an accountant. Mm -hmm. One day I even nodded off in a meeting. Someone had to nudge me to wake me up. It was very embarrassing. So eventually I just had to go to the GP, who said it was RSL. Right. And did your GP give you any advice on what to do? Well, he said to try to keep cool at night and use light cotton sheets rather than heavy blankets or a duvet. I'm not sure that has made much difference, though, because I certainly can't sleep if I get cold. The other thing he mentioned was doing some massage. I mean, I do it myself, and it does help to reduce the feelings. I do that before I go to bed each evening, but I can't do it whilst I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I've been relying more and more on black coffee and energy drinks during the day to help me stay awake, and he said to cut back on anything containing caffeine if I wanted to get a good night's rest. Mm -hmm. But then he also did a blood test for um, iron deficiency because he was talking about putting me on tablets for that. But the blood test was fine, so that's not the cause of all this. I see. Uh, and how is your health, generally? Fine. I don't smoke, mm -hmm. and I'm not overweight or anything. No. 
at some times of year I use antihistamines because I get bad hay fever. It's the pollen, you know. My GP asked me if anyone in the family had ever had the same problems, but I don't remember anything like that at all. Although I mentioned that my father had type two diabetes, and he did say that there's sometimes a link there, but、mm-hmm. he checked, and I'm not diabetic. So, what are you hoping that I can do for you? Well, that you'll be able to suggest something to help, because I'm just feeling so tired all the time, and my husband's fed up with it all. I mean, perhaps I need to take sleeping tablets. Also, I saw online that there's a place called a sleep clinic you can go to just overnight,、mm-hmm. and they look at your sleep patterns to see what's going on. When I mentioned that to my GP, that's when he suggested I come to see you. Extract two, questions thirteen to twenty-four. You hear a GP in a student health centre talking to a patient called Jason Bosworth. For questions thirteen to twenty-four, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. So, Jason, how can I help you today? Well, <laughs> it's a bit of a long story. I think maybe I should have come to see somebody before, you know, or perhaps I should have gone to the hospital when it first happened. I don't know. Okay. Well, let's start at the beginning. How old are you? Oh, I've just turned twenty-one. I'm in the final year of a sports science degree. Uh, as you can imagine, I get plenty of exercise. I'm generally fit and well, or at least I have been until now.、Mm-hmm. And I've not been plagued by injuries at all. Not like some people on my course have. So I guess I've been lucky. I see. So what's happened to change that? Well, what happened was I was out cycling. I reckon I do about a hundred kilometers a week usually. And I've never had an accident before, but for some reason, going round a sharp bend, I came off my bike.、Oh, it was stupid, really. Okay. And how long ago was this? Um, five days ago now. I mean, I had a few minor cuts and bruises, but nothing serious. So I didn't go for treatment or anything.、Mm-hmm. Fortunately, I had my helmet on because I did bang my head quite badly, but I felt all right at the time, so didn't think much of it. I was a bit shaken up. Yes. But the bike was all right, so I rode home and had an early night. And you slept okay? Oh yeah, I was fine. Only thing was, I woke up with a migraine. Now that didn't worry me particularly because I do get them occasionally, so I didn't immediately make any connection with the accident. I just took my normal medication, and as the day progressed, it wore off. And since then? Well, I've had no more pain. It's just that I've not been feeling my normal self, really. Like when I was at the gym, I started to get these dizzy spells. You know, like the room would start spinning suddenly, and I'd have to rest up. I've never had that before. Okay. Then at other times, I just don't feel right. It's as if I'm sort of floating. Do you know what I mean? It's as if I'm not quite all there. Right. And how often do you feel like this? Mm, well, all the time, really. It sort of comes and goes, but I haven't felt right for a couple of days now. Then sometimes I'm even like unsteady on my feet. You know, I have to hold on to something because I think I'm going to fall over. Oh dear. Maybe it's just a feeling, but it's not really like me. Then yesterday I got home and I couldn't find my keys. I went through all my pockets and really started to panic because I thought I must have dropped them in the street or something. Then I remembered that I was wearing the little backpack I use when I go jogging, and that's where they were. I mean, I never put them in there. 
I had no memory of doing that whatsoever. It was it was weird. Okay. And has anyone else noticed a change in you at all? Yeah, I went out for dinner because it was my friend's birthday. We went to this really lively restaurant in town, and the noise started to get to me. You know, it was it was just people talking and laughing and stuff. But I couldn't wait to get out of there. It wasn't really a great night, and afterwards, my girlfriend told me I'd been irritable for a couple of days, which isn't like me. So that's when I thought I'd better come and see somebody. Sure. And another reason is that I've got exams coming up, and I'm finding it really hard to concentrate. I've got a lot to do, so I need to knuckle down. And is there anything else worrying you? Anything else on your mind? Um, there is another thing actually. I've got a really big rugby match coming up. I'm in the college team, and it's the regional final. Um, I really want to be fit enough for that, but I'm wondering if I'm well enough to play. Okay, I'm beginning to get an idea of why you're concerned. What I'd like to do next is to run some tests. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions twenty-five to thirty, choose the answer A, B, or C. Which fits best according to what you hear? You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question twenty-five. You hear a nurse briefing a colleague about a patient. Now read the question. Okay, this is Linda. She's a sixty-year-old female who was admitted through emergency with chest pains today. She's abnormal ECG with a negative troponin so far, and she's reporting a five for her pain. That's down from eight on admission. She's on a cardiac diet, so she's nil by mouth from midnight, and she's okay with that. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, she's down for a stress test. She has a right forearm twenty gauge with normal saline at seventy-five. Linda's alert and oriented, and she can ambulate with assistance. She did report some dizziness in the ER, so we have a falls risk wristband in place. She's aware that if she needs to go to the bathroom, she needs to press the call button,、mm. but she's a bit resistant to the idea, so you need to keep an eye on her. She's also got two milligrams of morphine available for pain as needed every four hours. Okay. Question twenty-six. You hear a GP talking to a patient who has acne. Now read the question. So, how can I help you today? Well, basically, I've got a bit of acne, doctor. I mean, I had it as a teenager, and I was given some cream, which seemed to do the trick. But I can't remember what it was called. Do you think I could get some more of it? Well, it may not be the same type of acne you had before, because there are three types actually. We call them mild, moderate, and severe. And、uh, from what I can see, you seem to have mild acne. So this might just be caused by a build-up of grease on the skin. Um, how long ago are we talking about?、Oh, it must be about ten years back. I was still at school. I wasn't living around here then. I see. Well, the recommended medication may have changed since then. Of course. Did you have a prescription, or was it over the counter?、Mm, I couldn't tell you. Okay, not to worry. Tell me, how long has this particular episode been going on?、Uh, about three months now, and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better. I've been using special soap and stuff, trying to keep my skin clean. 
Uh, do you think I should see someone at the hospital? I saw online that they've got a dedicated dermatology unit. Well, I think there are a number of things we can try before we need to think about that. So let's start by discussing which soap you... Question 27. You hear a surgeon briefing his team before an operation. Now read the question. Our first patient of the day is a repeat laparotomy. He's got an unexpected finding after surgery for an appendix abscess. He's got a tumour at the base of the cecum. So he's going to need a bit more of a detailed laparotomy and resection. I suspect we're going to have to convert to open surgery sooner rather than later. I wouldn't open a lot of laparostic instruments at this stage, though. We'll just see how it looks. It's a couple of months since he had his original surgery. So just an entry port and one other? Yes, that's right. We don't expect any anaesthesia problems at the beginning because he's fairly fit and well, except for his epilepsy, which is under very good control. His BMI is also 35, but it shouldn't affect us. We don't need the obesity bed for him. Question 28. You hear a nurse educator telling a group of trainees about pressure ulcers. Now read the question. As we saw last week, adult hospitalized patients are given the Norton scale to establish the risk of pressure ulcers. If, when applying the scale, the score is 5 to 10 points, that is, elevated risk, a blue sticker should be placed on the bedhead in order to inform and alert the patient, family members and the interdisciplinary team of this risk. Once the patient is placed at blue level risk, the patient and the family must be informed of the care plan established to mitigate it, and a special clock will be placed at the bedside to prompt changes in position. In the case of paediatric patients, however, the scale isn't applied. But this is to do with the limitations of the scale, rather than the absence of risk. Neonates and paediatric patients hospitalised in critical areas, as well as children with limited mobility due to neurological disorders, and of course those who rely on orthopaedic devices, such as splints, casts, etc., are all considered at high risk. Question 29. You hear a GP talking to a patient. Now read the question. So, how can I help you today? Well, what's happened is my brother's just been told that he's got this condition where there's too much iron in his blood. I can't remember the name, but it was hemo-something. Hemochromatosis? Yeah, that sounds right. I mean, he's having treatment and he's going to be OK, but apparently what the specialist told him is that this can be passed on in the genes. So if he's got it, then there's every likelihood I've got it too that I should have a blood test, because if it's not treated, it can lead to other things, even if you've had no symptoms yet. I see. And did your brother tell you anything else? Yeah, he said it wasn't the full condition because of another thing. He read out a string of numbers and another long name. Oh, yes, I know what that might be. OK, well, let me explain a bit about this condition, and then we can decide what we need to do. Question 30. You hear two nurses conducting a handover at the change of shift. Now read the question.
Next, we have Mrs. Floyd, who's sleeping at the moment. Okay. She's a sixty-year-old who was admitted as an emergency overnight with a suspected bowel obstruction. She has a history of bowel cancer, resected five years ago. Okay. The doctors are looking into whether there might be adhesions or a stricture at the operation site. Obviously, she's concerned that the cancer may have returned, and her daughter's coming in later to speak to the doctor. That's all set up. I see. Meanwhile, her temperature is thirty-seven point eight, pulses eighty beats per minute, and respiration twenty-five breaths a minute.、Mm-hmm. Blood pressure is one fifty over ninety. She has a nasogastric tube on low pressure suction to manage nausea and vomiting, and intravenous normal saline at one hundred and twenty-five milliliters an hour. Okay. The next bag needs to have potassium chloride added.、Uh, see the orders for that. Okay. Her skin's quite dry but intact, and you'll need to consider mouth care. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions thirty-one to forty-two, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. Extract one, questions thirty-one to thirty-six. You hear an interview with a scrub nurse called Joanna Swan. You now have ninety seconds to read questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Today I'm talking to Joanna Swan, who works as a scrub nurse in the operating theatre. Joanna, firstly, remind us what a scrub nurse is exactly, and where the name comes from. Sure. Well, perioperative nurse is the correct term, of course. But basically, we're all familiar with the notion of scrubbing in. You know, you've seen surgeons doing it. It's not just washing your hands; it's doing that very thorough cleaning to ensure you're completely sterile before you go anywhere near the patient or the surgical instruments.、Mm-hmm. But the name scrub nurse doesn't quite capture the full role. I mean, basically, your job's to prepare the operating room for surgery. You lay out the instruments, hand them to the surgeon when asked, and、uh, you're also responsible for monitoring the patient. So you're like the bridge between the surgical team and everyone else who's supporting the patient.、Mm. So, how did you first get into this type of nursing? I remember one of my most formative experiences as a student nurse was shadowing a perioperative nurse in theatre. I had to scrub up too, and I was expected to lend a hand because they didn't want somebody just standing around in the way. 
Uh, it was all new to me, and I was worried how I'd react. I was fine around blood, but I'd never seen a wound being created before. It was a 30-minute hernia op, so nothing special, but it left a deep impression on me. Then later, uh, when I'd reached the stage in my career where I was up for a challenge, that image came back to me. Mm. And what sort of background do you need to go into this kind of nursing? Well, you can do specialist courses, but I think what's crucial is having a fair amount of nursing experience, particularly in critical care settings. That was true of me, and there's really no substitute for that. To be honest, the job wouldn't suit everybody. The hours can be gruelling and the work's very demanding. Mm. You can't just pop out to the bathroom or have a snack when you feel like it. And um, you're stuck in a small room with some quite strong personalities who are also under pressure. So it's a very intense environment, but also a very rewarding one. Mm. And what skills does it call for? Well, basically every second counts. You've got to be very efficient and able to think ahead and get things organised. You know, um, what needs doing immediately, what can wait a few moments, what you need to do now because you might not get the chance later and so on. Mm. I mean, that's the kind of thing you can train somebody for up to a point. But to do it well, you've got to be in the mindset to start with. Attention to detail is crucial. Um, if that's not how you are, then you're not going to be right for the job. You have to be there mentally 100% as well as physically. And I guess the idea of the team is really important in theatre. Mm, indeed. It's got to be part of the system. I mean, especially when you're on call, you never know who you're going to be working with. For an operating theatre to run smoothly, there's got to be clear communication and coordination between everyone concerned, because it's the collaboration within the team that keeps patients alive. Mm. In my hospital, to promote team spirit, we set great store by meetings, at the preoperative briefing, of course, but also meetings to discuss issues and generate new ideas. As a nurse, it's great to feel that your voice counts, and that's not always the case in medicine. So for me, that's a big plus. We also take opportunities to debrief staff after difficult events. I mean, that's crucial too. Mm. And what about the interactions with the patients? Well... Some people have the idea that in the operating theatre you're going to be having just mechanistic interventions on patients who are in no position to respond or interact with the nurse, that you're just providing support to the surgeon and the anaesthetist. But these days, theatre nurses are required to have a holistic, patient-centred approach to care, and this extends beyond the period of the patient's actual surgical experience. Preoperative visitings become the norm so that patients see a familiar face when they come in for treatment. And this can really reduce stress levels on the day for the patient. For me, this is a really positive development and I'm always keen to take on that role. Now look at extract two. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear a junior doctor called Graham Holder giving a presentation on the subject of hand transplants. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Good morning. My name's Graham Holder. I'm a junior doctor here at the hospital. The subject of my presentation today is hand transplants. I'm not a specialist in this area and I have no direct experience of it, but I've always found it fascinating and I'd like to share my interest in it with you. So, first of all, what is a hand transplant and why is it better than prostheses? Well, it's a type of a CTA, that's a composite tissue allotransplantation, in which skin, fat, muscle and nerve bone are all transferred from one person to another. To date, it's largely been used to treat patients with both functional and aesthetic deficits that can't be dealt with by conventional methods, but this is changing. The mainstay of treatment for amputated limbs has long been prostheses, but patients often reject them because they only provide limited mobility and function, and they can be uncomfortable. In theory, at least, transplanting a complete part should give much better results than even the most advanced prosthetic technology. So, more and more upper limb transplants are being performed around the world every year, and this is largely thanks to new and more powerful immune-suppressive drugs. The strategies in use have been derived from the experience of transplanting organs, especially kidneys, and this has also informed the choice of drugs. Slightly higher amounts of immune suppression are used with a potent induction, followed by a low-dose maintenance regime. This regime can be supplemented by short courses of intensive therapy to overcome any episode of acute rejection. The survival rate of both patients and grafts under this regimen outperforms that for all other transplants. That's actually pretty impressive. At least one episode of rejection is recorded in 90% of cases, however, despite the immune suppressive protocol, and this is much higher than with kidney transplants. One reason for this is that hand transplantation represents a visible graft. That means you can make an immediate diagnosis of rejection based on minor changes in skin appearance, even though this has to be confirmed by a biopsy. If patients adhere to the regime, however, rejection is generally reversible. One of the challenges of hand transplantation is to achieve the delicate balance that prevents rejection whilst at the same time protecting patients from the direct toxicity of the medicaments. But this seems to be working, and infection is actually the commonest complication. So, what happens during a hand transplant operation? It's a six-hour procedure which involves two separate surgical teams, one removing the hand from the donor and the other working with the recipient. Bones are joined with titanium plates and screws. As with other bone grafts, they should eventually heal together, but the plates are left in to ensure stability. Surgeons then connect key muscles and tendons before tiny blood vessels are connected using surgical microscopes. Three major nerves are then attached, followed by large and small veins. Once blood is circulating, the recipient begins to feel the new hand. A recent case attracted a lot of interest in the UK. It was a bilateral transplant for a man who'd lost both hands in an accident at work. Now, bilateral transplants aren't so uncommon, but what made the case particularly noteworthy was the fact that he still had both his thumbs, but not the rest of his hands. So it wasn't a transplant performed at the wrist, as is usually the case, but in the substance of both hands. Nonetheless, immediately afterwards, he managed to gain some movement in his donor hands and has since improved dramatically. Indeed, just nine months after the procedure, he was able to write a thank you letter to the surgeon. His recovery experience mirrors that of most transplant patients. The incredible thing about him is the speed at which he's gained that functionality. So, what about donors? One of the challenges of hand transplantation is that the hands not only have to fit immunologically, they also have to look right because they're going to be on view, an issue that doesn't arise with internal organs. That makes the job of finding an appropriate donor even harder. 
In any case, because hand transplantation is rather unusual, people have been slow to donate, and there've been occasions when surgeons had to ask for a donation when somebody's offered other organs, but not specifically the hands, and that's a really difficult thing to negotiate with next of kin at the time of death. The hand transplant program is now established, and it's becoming mature. It'd be nice to think that hand transplants could become as routine as kidney transplants. Setting up a donor network is the next goal. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.